This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is Vittorio De Sica's great film, The Bicycle Thief, a.k.a. Bicycle Thieves. I have two people who will talk about it, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The Bicycle Thief, a.k.a. Bicycle Thieves by Vittorio De Sica is one of the great classic films of all time. Back in the mid-20th century, it was considered the greatest film of all time by Sight & Sound magazine. Uh, it has come down a little bit in... Uh, the estimation of some critics, but it's still a great film and one that is, I think, a little bit overlooked today. Uh, I have two people who will be discussing it. On the left, I have Mark Colin Enders. As I like to always do, I want to give my guests a few minutes to give a little bit of background about themselves and their opening volleys about whatever the subject is. So Mark, who is uh, in Australia, uh, welcome. Thank you for making time. And if you could give a little bit of background about yourself and some opening thoughts about uh, the film. Yeah, um, so I'm a physiotherapist, a physical therapist, as you, as you call me in the States. Um, I actually worked in Chicago back in the early 90s. Um, and while I was there, I, I was uh, a very re uh, frequent uh, visitor to a, a beautiful cinema called um, The Music Box. I used to go there all the time. I uh, watched a lot of great films and I actually saw this film there, um, fortunately enough. Uh, in the early um, 2000s, I completed a master's degree in screenwriting, wrote a short film called uh, The Brisbane Bard, uh, which was released in 2011. Um, you can find it on YouTube if you're sufficiently interested. Uh, and then since 2013, I've been running uh, a cinema group called um, Townsville Classic Films. So we only show films that are more than 30 years old. And we also invite a lot of film guests up to Townsville as well. So we've had, um, you know, people like uh, Peter Weir, uh, Bruce Beresford, uh, all, all Australian filmmakers, obviously. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, I also I've got a, a, a YouTube page uh, where I don't really do film reviews. I more provide backgrounds about films. So you know, giving people appreciation of not necessarily what the film is about, but you know, its context, its importance some of the things that happened around the time of its production and, and certainly reasons to try and watch it. And I've also got a, a I've started a Substack blog, blog sort of kind of fairly recently just uh, talking about sort of kind of film related topics. Now, The Bicycle Thieves is a film that's really, really important to me because it was the first film that I guess inspired my love of cinema. Um, I, I first saw it when I was about 15, 16, I think. Um, I, I dropped out of school. Um, I was washing dishes in a local cafe uh, and my dad was a local school teacher uh, and he, uh, he, he was screening these films for his students and, and I happened to sit in on, on a screening of this particular film. Um, he showed it on 16mm, uh, you know, so the projector was rolling. Uh, we were sitting in the, uh, the Earth Science Laboratory, we were surrounded by rocks, and I was just totally blown away by this particular film. Like it was, um, I, I felt like I understood a lot of things um, immediately about, you know, I guess post-war Italy, uh, you know, the struggles of dealing with economic hardship, um, but also, you know, the really important personal stories uh, that, you know, the, the story around, you know, the, the love between a father and a son and, and some of the, the challenges that, uh, that that relationship can go through. And your website, just so we know, is www.townsvilleclassicfilm.com? That's correct, yeah. Uh, on the right side of the screen is Vincent Petruro. This is his second go-round uh, on one of these films. Uh, Vincent, if you could give a little background about yourself and your opening thoughts about the film. Yeah, well, um, hello, Dan. Hello, Mark. Um, I am Vincent Petoro, uh, Professor of Film and Media Studies at uh, Metropolitan State University of Denver in Denver, Colorado, current home of the um, Stanley Cup. And I, um, I have been teaching film for over 20 years. And, uh, you know, I have a kind of a similar story to Mark's about the, the film Bicycle, Thie Bicycle Thieves. Um, not the bicycle thief nor the bicycle thieves but just bicycle thieves um we'll talk about that a little bit though actually a lot probably. but but um i have a similar story to, to you mark in that it, it was the first film i saw in my first film class in college and it was a time that i didn't know what i wanted to do in life and i just went back to school and took some classes and i know hey i like movies so let me take a film class and while I fell in love with it, I fell in love with Bicycle Thieves, and it uh, became um, one of my favorite films of all time, probably in top two or three, actually. 
And I, um, I've written about it uh, several times cool. during the course of my academic career. I taught it many, many, many times. I wrote part of my dissertation actually when I did my PhD on the film. Um, I um, love to talk about the movie in any way, shape, or form. Um, the historical context, like you talked about, Mark, um, I, I can talk about that. I can talk about the critics, uh, how they've looked at it over the past um, 70 years. Um, I can talk about it from a theoretical lens, from a reception sort of way of looking at it as well, um, but also just from the humanistic view of it as well, which I, I think um, was very much from De Sica, but also from the writer Cesare Zavattini. Um, so um, love to talk about it, um, you know, look forward to it, and I, I look forward to a great conversation. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the film background wise before we get into what's actually on screen. And since we did bring it up, um, yes, the, the actual Italian title is, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, La Vie de Bicicletta, or Bicicletta, uh, which is plural, Bicycle Thieves. Uh, and I remember uh, when we spoke a couple of years ago, uh, what, the, what film did we do together? Um, I, I was trying to remember that today, and I could not remember for the life of me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I know you had uh, you said you preferred the plural, uh, and the American was the uh, the American title was appended on, just like, for example, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, is Gojira in Japanese. Um, and I had said that I thought that the the singular uh, left, and not that I'm big on spoilers, but in this day and age, a lot of people. Uh, it, it makes the revelation at the end with the father's final act, basically, it gives that an extra one because people don't see it coming. And your your counter claim was what regarding the plural? So, um, well, first of all, yes, it's the original title of the film. La Didi di Bicicletta in Italian is the plural. La Didi is the plural. La Ilado, L-A-D-O, is the thief. In fact, you hear, um, Antonio yell when his bike is first stolen, Ilado, Ilado, and he's saying that, you know, thief, thief. Um, so the actual title is Bicycle Thieves, plural. Um, but even if you know that title, as you move along, there are a couple of people involved in the theft of the, you know, of, of the bike. First of all, I'm assuming everybody's seen this movie. Yeah. Anybody watching this has probably seen the movie. If they, ha if they haven't and they're watching this first, I don't know what you've been doing, but, um, I'm assuming everybody's seen the movie. So if you're if it's plural, plural. The end is going to be making any different. It's because you see several thieves, like the old man, for example, um, that they find and they follow him into the church run by the Americans, Quakers. Um, he's part of a group. So it's a part of a group that stole the bike. So you can think all along it's 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 plural. Um, and at the end, of course, there's the, you know, actual Antonio who becomes a bicycle thief himself. But I think it goes well beyond that in several ways. And here are the ways that I think it goes beyond that. Well, first of all, it's speaking about a society, as Mark, you were talking about, a very depressed, very beaten down society. Um, nobody had jobs, money, et cetera, um, in this era, in this post-World War II era. If we can get into the politics of it, there was... Um, America instituted no Marshall Plan immediately after the war in Italy uh, because there was an election and the election was going to be between the Christian Democrats with the capitalists and then basically a combination of so uh, socialists and communists backed by the Russians. The Americans wanted to wait to see the end of that, of that, uh, of that outcome. So, and that's even an interesting story in itself. Maybe we can get into that. But um, so there was no Marshall Plan directly after World War II like there was in Germany and Japan where we started to rebuild right away. We waited. And in that interim, Italy was very depressed in every which way, economically, socially, politically. And so um, I see the title as speaking to all Italians at that moment because any one Italian could be a bicycle thief at any moment in that society. And that's maybe the most powerful um, interpretation of it that I see. Also, secondarily, in a reader response kind of way, is I always ask people, when you get to that second to last scene, when his son is sitting kind of on the corner and Antonio is looking at the singular bike over by the wall there and then the, the rack of bikes at the soccer match, and he's looking and it cuts 
film was wonderful. It cuts back and forth from the single bike to the rack of bikes and back and forth. As viewers, and I always ask my class this, what were you thinking at that point? What, were you, what was going through your mind at that point? And when they're honest, you know, they say, I was saying he should have stolen one of the bikes from the, you know, from the rack. And some will say, no, he should have just gotten a single one and had his son look out for him. And they come up with all these elaborate plans about how he, he should steal the bike. And I said, well, look what the film has done. It's turned you, the viewer, into a bicycle thief. Now you become complicit in the action. And because we want him to succeed at stealing a bike without thinking about everything that person whose bike he's stealing is going to go through when we just saw it an hour and a half of what Antonio had to go through. But it also so shows Antonio's basic honesty in that he doesn't think in that way naturally the way the, the other thieves do. Yeah, yeah. So I, those are the two reasons why I love the uh, the plural. I think it was it was given that was only given the singular title in the states. Um, it played in Europe and England and other English speaking countries. I can't speak for um, Australia, but in England it played uh, with the with the actual title Bicycle Thieves. And um, we can talk about that um, too in a little while. You know, Mark, you talked about its influence on you. I had you know this was tremendously influenced on my life and what I do. Um, but it was extremely influential in the history of world cinema from Satyajit Ray in India to the Chinese fifth generation directors um, to uh, uh, Usman Senbani in, in, um, in Africa. And, you know, they can, so many filmmakers throughout history have pointed to this as their inspiration. Mark, any comments on the title? And then we'll take off. Um, I've only ever known it as Bicycle Thieves, so I guess I was never torn between the two titles. I've always just accepted that was it, but I, I agree with everything Vincent says. Um, and I think that's one of the powers of the film, like um, as much as the theft of that bicycle uh, very early in the film devastated Vincent, um, the thieves weren't affluent people. They were sort of kind of struggling just to put food on the table and, and Vincent was pushed to that point to steal that bicycle, which was then going to, you know, visit Antonio, pain and suffering. Not Vincent, Antonio. I'm sorry, you got, you, got, you got your Italians mixed up. <laughs> sorry, Vinci, not a bicycle thief. Well, there's Vittorio, there's Vincent, and then there's Antonio. And, and you know what, though, Mark? My middle name is Anthony, so you're close. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, yeah, like, I think it's, it's judgment-free. Like, I mean, it, it was a very difficult period, and, and, and I guess it sort of kind of speaks to human nature in a sense. Like, we aren't necessarily thieves or, or sort of kind of horrible people, but circumstances can push us into those those choices and decisions where maybe it feels like we don't have a choice you know yeah i guess for, for me and just my final comment on that is uh I, I think of sort of the ahabian obsession that antonio has throughout the film with the bicycle leaf and getting the bicycle back and then at the end when it turns around that he has to become or tries to become a bicycle thief there's that double whammy it's the reverse what does the title really mean so i understand both both sides like like you mark here in, in the u.s for 60 years or something, it was called The Bicycle Thief. So I've always been accustomed to that. But let's talk about, and let me turn to you, Vincent, let's talk about uh, neorealism itself and uh, it, it coming after World War II, um, and a specifically Italian neorealism, where that sort of all unfolded. Um, uh, what was Italian cinema like pre-war and then post-war, and how does this film fit into it? Yeah, um... Uh, yeah, I can uh, address all that. Let me just say one more thing about the title, though. That I want to say. The singular title, I always thought, believed that it was given the singular title in the States because Americans need a protagonist and an antagonist, a very clear sort of dividing line. Um, so giving it that name makes you think there's a good guy and a bad guy. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think as Mark absolutely nailed it, saying it's judgment-free. So um, Getting to uh, Italian neorealism. Okay, so pre-war Italian cinema was actually quite vibrant. Um, Mussolini, for all the horrible things he did, uh, actually was great for the cinema industry. Uh, Mussolini built the wonderful um, studio Cinecittà in uh, what was suburban uh, you know, Rome, which if you go there, it actually is still pretty suburban Rome. Um, and it's kind of a rundown area actually now. Um, but Cinecita is still standing. It's still a working studio. Um, but uh, it, um, 
Mussolini built that studio and he was a big uh, fan of movies and he really wanted to make movies and push Italian movies out to the world. However, um, the fascists pretty much banned everything. So um, it was worse than the code was, in, you know, in the 19, starting in the 1930s in the U.S. So there's no sex or violence or uh, political talk or anything. So basically what you had in the Mussolini era pre-war were films that were um, very saccharine. You had romantic comedies or just romances or period pieces. They became known as the white telephone films. And uh, the reason they were known as the white telephone films is because there's the ubiquitous plastic white telephone, you know, on the on the table uh, in, in the shot. It was obviously fake. Um, and nobody in Italy even had phones in that period. And so, so these, you know, this fake phone and this phony world of, of, of bad movies, um, that became the symbol for this kind of this vapid, you know, useless basically cinema that nobody loved. Um, however, there was an actor that came out of that period uh, who was kind of the Cary Grant of Italian cinema in the 30s and into the early 40s. Uh, he became quite famous and quite rich, and his name was Vittorio De Sica. And um, so he went on, obviously, to direct some great films. Um, it's always been ironic that he's directed the, you know, this great film about the struggle of the people when he was a, a wealthy actor, you know, coming into this. Neorealism, it's a tiny neorealism took shape uh, after the war, number one, out of necessity, but number two, um, out of a desire for the filmmakers to uh, go against what they had seen before the war, um, but also as an antidote to Hollywood cinema um, that just showed sheer fantasy as far as they were concerned in Italy in 1945. So a couple of points there, and I'll, I'll expand. Um, first of all, the name neorealism, everybody always asks, what does that mean? What's the new realism? What was the old realism? Um, the reason it was called neorealism is because it was uh, uh, an offshoot of the French realist films of the 20s and 30s. Um, if you think Jean Renoir, for example, um, and that, that uh, The River, um, that uh, period of films was called French realism. Um, this was Italian, so they had to name it Italian. Um, they didn't want to copy realism, so it became new realism, mm. Italian new realism. Um, as far as, um, you know, a matter of uh, necessity, well, um, goods were scarce, uh, electricity was scarce, everything was scarce uh, post-war. And the first great neorealist film, and we could argue about that, right? It could be Ossessione. Um, but the first great well-known uh, neorealist film was Rossellini's Roma Open, or Rome Open City, 1945, which was literally made as the Germans were leaving the, uh, leaving the city. And you can see bombing in the background in several of the scenes, and it's actual bombing on the outskirts of the city. And of course, the name Rome Open City refers to the, the World War Pact, supposedly, there were cities around the world that would be left untouched because of their historical value. Rome, um, uh, Athens, um, I forget which other cities were on the list, but Rome was on that list. And it was sort of a joke because it wasn't left untouched. So um, when Rossellini was making the video, he had to scrape for everything. He had to scrape for film stock. Um, they, they didn't have any external light, so they had to shoot in the streets. Uh, actors were dispersed all over the world. They had left, you know, um, under fascism, so there were few left. So he had to use non-professionals in many of the roles. Um, although there are professional actors in Rome Open City, many are, are non-professionals. There's a lot of on-location, um, you know, shooting. There's not a lot of studio stuff. So that sort of became a template, all those things. They concentrated on the regular people. They looked at, you know, the, the, the poor um, and the forgotten classes. Um, they they used real locations. Izanzen was real. They used non-professional actors, um, even though they had dense uh, sort of uh, thematic. They had thematic density. The plots were fairly simple. The bicycle thief man has his bike. He needs it for a job, and he looks around for it for a few days. That's the movie. Um, but there's a lot more going on to it. There's a lot of social commentary, political commentary, 
um, socioeconomic commentary as well. Um, Vittoria De Sica and Vice of Thieves comes a couple of years later, uh, 1948, on the verge of that national, important national election. And he took um, Russell Lee a step further and used all non-professionals. We can get into that as we, as we go. And I'm sure uh, Mark knows plenty about those, those actors and where they came from. They're great stories. Um, and so he used the non-professional actors um, you know, on yeah. set, we're in the streets, very few studio locations, um, you know, looking at the, the poorer people. In fact, there's levels of poor in Michael Thieves itself. Um, the Ricci family that we see is probably better yeah. off than some of the other families we see. Um, there's a lot of political content uh, in Bicycle Thieves as well, just like there was in Rome Open City, maybe even more with subtext in Bicycle Thieves. Um, it was a short-lived uh, movement, really. If you say 1945 is the beginning, the end is really 1952 with uh, De Sica's Umberto D, which is basically about a man walking around with his dog for a couple of days. And um, the Italians by then didn't want to, didn't care. They didn't want to see poor. They didn't want to see down Italy. Um, the Marshall Plan had taken effect now after the Christian Democrats won the election in 1948. And Italians were sick of it. They wanted to move on. They wanted better movies. And so um, neorealism ended quickly. Now, as far as the movement itself, its um, influence on the rest of the world, however, still lives on today. And you know, we can get into some of that. We can get also get into the antidote to Hollywood kind of films from 1945 to 1948, if you'd like. Let me ask Mark about neorealism. Since you uh, you said that you screen films for your groups, um, what what is the the reaction of especially younger people who weren't alive, uh, you know, back in the fifties? Uh, does neorealism, when they first see it, do they say, "Wow, this is very different than films these days"? I, I guess that's a very mixed reaction. I mean, everyone's an individual, uh, and they bring their individual sort of kind of you know frame and experience to to the films that we show. Um, a lot of our, our um, members are actually older people, so um, obviously they, they weren't around at the time, uh, but they may well be familiar with some of these older films. Most of them probably, though, are seeing these films for the first time. Uh, the reason why we've focused on films that are more than 30 years old is, it, I guess, it's a generation or a generation and a half. Um, our collective social memories are so short, um, and there's such a rich... Uh, history of film. Um, you know, we showed films as old as 1902, you know, so um, a, a lot of films people haven't seen, but the reaction, um, most people aren't as passionate about films like this as I am. Um, and again, maybe this is, maybe my taste in film was shaped by Bicycle Thieves very early on. There's another film I love um, from the UK called The Sporting Life. I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with it. I, I've done yeah, that. That's on my great films list. Yeah, it's a fantastic film. Kitchen it's, sink drama, they call it. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's a tough watch at the same time, you know, and yeah. and, and so is this film. And um, I don't know how much appetite there is for people to watch really, really hard, difficult stories. And um, the reason why I love those kind of films is because, you know, I, I think the most beautiful human emotion is, is that of empathy more than anything else. And, you know, understanding and, and feeling someone else's suffering and, and, and not wanting that to be perpetuated sort of as time goes by is a really healthy attitude to have. And um, equally, I, I guess, having an understanding of how tough things can be economically and how that affects people, <clears throat> you know, I guess gives you a bit of a political frame as well. And with the world potentially on the verge of a fairly significant economic downturn, I think it's it's a film that's sort of kind of very timely as well. Let me go back to you, Vincent. Um, before the film was made, uh, a lot of European films uh, then and even now were, were government sponsored. Was uh, neorealism seen as sort of a, a, a way for Italy to redeem itself in the eyes of the world uh, after their participation in the war when you know going to various film festivals because I know some of that uh, was Japan also with the the rise of their great uh, uh, filmmakers in the 40s and 50s was uh, that was a way you know that a lot of people got a different idea of what Japan was was this true also with Italy and, and neorealism it was not. Um, it was not seen like that by it, by the industry, by the filmmakers and actors, etc. Because there wasn't really anything centralized in Italy at that point. The government was worthless um, until the Christian Democrats took over in forty in forty eight, 
Um, and then the Americans finally came in and, and started to help rebuild. Um, so it was really, they had to, you know, DeSica basically bankrolled, uh, bankroll, uh, bankrolled Bicycle Feet himself. Um, Rossellini came from a, a money family. He bankrolled uh, Rome Open City himself as well. Um, so it wasn't any concerted effort by government or by, you know, it wasn't a giant corporation like UFA that pushed the German films after World War I. Um, so it was basically the filmmakers. Um, it was a filmmaker run, uh, you know, kind of movement. Um, there's some actors that were involved in it. And Lucchino Visconti was another filmmaker who was, who was a, came from royalty. Yeah, he was a dude. Um, yeah, and he was able to bankroll his own films. Um, and some actors were well known, but it was mostly just self-funded and, um, you know, it was like self-interest, I guess you could say. Um, but those films really caught on around the rest of the world, much more so than they did in Italy. Bicycle Thieves wasn't even in the top five films of the year in Italy of 1948. It was down the list. So uh, let me turn to you, Mark. Um, before we get into talking about the film itself, let me just talk about the two co-leads, the father and son team. Uh, when I've looked over uh, reviews from all the decades, uh, the boy, uh, Enzo Staiola, Bruno, seems to get all the plaudits. But I have to say, I just this past weekend, for, in preparation for the show, I rewatched the film after about five or six years not watching it. And I was even more impressed with Lamberto Majorani, the, the father, Antonio. Um, and in thinking of other uh, people who have used non-acting uh, actors. Uh, I just rewatched Black Narcissus that had some non-acting actors. I, I recently, within the last five or six months, watched uh, The River. Uh, I'm familiar with Bresson's films later on uh, and you know some of the works of a lot of European filmmakers with, with uh, non-actors. And I have to say, there's maybe only two or three other actors I can think of who give as good a performance as Majorani. Um, uh, so let me ask you, do you agree uh, that he has sort of gotten short shrifted in favor of his filmic son? Because it, not much, not nearly as much uh, praise for his performance I've read. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know that uh, at the time the seeker really strongly suggested that he, that, that be his first and last film. He suggested he go back on the tools and sort of kind of go back to his sort of kind of labouring job. Um, but, you know, Majorani was, I guess, taken with filmmaking and, and acting and, and made a number of films after that, which I guess were much of much lower quality. And maybe that's affected his, <laughs> I can see a cat there, <laughs> um, it affected his, uh, his reputation to some extent. But I guess I don't, I, I look at both of those actors and I think, you know, what, what's really magical about the film is the way that they play off each other. They do feel very much like father and son. And um, a lot of their reactions, I think, that you're seeing on screen were, were very authentic. Um, you know, particularly, I think, that sort of kind of final scene where it's, you know, very heavy, emotionally heavy. Um, and, you know, the tears that are sort of kind of welling in, in young Bruno's eyes uh, really affected uh, Lamberto uh, Maggiorani as well. And and rather than it being acting, I think it's just sort of kind of pure human emotion. I think that's what's really engaging about it. Hey, Vincent, do you think that uh, Chaplin's The Kid and Jackie Coogan uh, played a part in this pairing? Um, may, perhaps in De Sica's, you know, eyes. Maybe maybe it was conscious, maybe probably more like subconscious, but, uh, you know, all of the Italians of the... the the 40s were all huge silent film fans and huge Chaplin fans. Um, people forget that Rossellini made Rome Open City, but his co-writer on the film was Federico Fellini. Um, and he, Fellini wrote the comic sequences in Rome Open City. And, um, he, you know, of course, he was a huge Chaplin fan. And we saw homage to Chaplin all the time. Well, his, um, wife, his wife played a female Chaplin in a couple of films, basically. Exactly. In La Strada, for yeah. example. And... Um, and uh, De Sica knew Charlie Chaplin. Um, they were, you know, world famous stars in the 30s. Um, so I'm sure that was, you know, maybe not front of mind, um, and but but it was there. And uh, De Sica also did some really kind of nasty, underhanded things too, um, working with the non professionals to to, uh, to to get them to act how he wanted. And, and we can go into that if you want, or we can tease that for later. Well, that's fine. Um, so let's talk now about the film uh, proper. The film opens with uh, a man coming out uh, 
uh, you know, uh, looking to pass our jobs. It reminded me of On the Waterfront a few years later, a, a similar kind of situation. Uh, but uh, uh, the main character, Antonio, uh, yes, Antonio, uh, is across the street, you know, preoccupied with something else. And one of his buddies, I guess, has to come and pull him into the job. And so you get you get a, a sense right away of, uh, you know, that there's some there's something else. I mean, uh, Antonio is 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 poor, as you said, but he's not the poorest of the poor at that time. Um, let me just turn to you then, Vincent. Uh, set that scene a little bit more than I just did and where it goes with it and how, how it how it sort of is the foundation for the rest of the film. Yeah, it is in so many ways, and we get you know cinematic graphically, it's wonderful. Um, it has the uh, the famous deep focus and long take right over the credits. Um, so we sit on that for a long time, and of course the great French uh, writer Andre Bazin wrote about it, um, you know, and coined the term you know film realism based on Renoir and and Bicycle Thieves because he said that's uh, that was the closest approximation to reality we get is the combination of a deep focus shot with the long take. And that's what we get there in that, in that opening. Um, and um, we see in the foreground, Ricci is sitting there, is kind of playing, is sitting on the ground, playing in a puddle of water, like a little kid. And in the background, we see the yeah. gathering, which we find out is the group gathering to find out what jobs are available that day. As the as the man comes out and reads off the jobs, so his friend runs over to him after his name is called to grab him because he's not even paying attention. He's playing in this puddle, and then he gets he walks him over, and he finds out he has a job and he needs his bike. And then we, you know, next scene he tells his wife and they have to go take his get his bike out of the pawn shop. Um, so the the reason it sets the scene is the cinematography sets the scene. Um, it announces to us that it's realism because of the cinematography and the editing or lack of editing. It um, shows the group of men that are desperate, all wanting, needing jobs. Um, so we get a sense for some of them have lost hope, lost faith, like this, like uh, Antonio may have, you know, why he wasn't sitting there and paying attention. Um, and how mad they're all getting about the whole job situation. Well, I have a bike. Yeah, but you're listed as a carpenter. Um, you're not a messenger, but you know, I can, I can do it. You know, I can ride a bike, but, but you're not in the right category. Um, and so it also sets up this idea of the institutions are fighting against the people. They're not working for the people, but they're fighting against them. So we get all those things in just the first minute or two of the movie. Well, also it's sort of almost a divide and conquer tactic that, uh, we're going to pass, pacify this, this, these set of people this day, tomorrow will be the next guy. And and whatnot, um, uh, Mark. Uh, after after we he gets the job, we we meet his wife, and there's a few scenes with his wife. Uh, what is what was your take on uh, the domestic scenes, if you want to call them that, that early in the film? Before I go there, I just want to go back to the very very start of the film. I th I think it starts before they're handing out jobs. Like it's really that that bus sort of kind of snaking through the streets. Clearly, it's quite a, a, a impoverished sort of kind of slum-like sort of kind of area. Um, that really sort of kind of heavy mood music that actually sort of kind of sets you up for the entire film. You know, you you realise that all these people are living in in difficult times um, and in difficult circumstances, uh, and then that sort of then plays into all the stuff that, that Vincent was talking about. Um, but as far as the domestic situation, yeah, he he um, he accepts the job even though he doesn't really have his bike yet, um, and. Uh, he, he doesn't sort of kind of necessarily see a solution and, and his wife's uh, waiting in line for water with a, quite a few other um, housewives and women in that particular area. Um, and she sort of kind of, you know, she encourages and she talks him up and, and you know, they've already made a lot of sacrifices uh, to sort of kind of continue to eat. Um, and then, you know, the, the final sacrifice, I guess, is that they're going to do with that bed sheets. Um, and I guess that shows uh, from a domestic situation how despite how difficult the times were, this was still a very cohesive family unit and they were still sort of kind of looking on the positive side, still trying to find a way forward, still trying to trying to find a way to support each other. Yeah, I got the sense, um, going back to them with him playing in the water to open the scene, that Antonio is, quote unquote, the dreamer and the wife is the realist. You get a sense that that she she's the center of that family, 
you know, he may be the man, but she wears the pants in that family. Did, did either of you get that sense? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Um, not so much wears the pants. Like you say, she was the one who made things happen. Um, so she wasn't necessarily um, the matriarch in a sense, but, she, you know, she could see a way through a difficult circumstance and find a solution. So, yeah, she, she was very uh, practical. Well, it, and you, 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 you kind of set up that uh, dichotomy there between the two of them. Yeah, he was the dreamer. If you notice, he's playing in the puddle of water, not paying attention. When we first meet her, she's literally carrying the family's water. Yeah. Um, she's coming back from the well with buckets of water and bringing it back to their house. And so, she has I mean, to ask him to carry one. <laughs> right. He doesn't even like realize she's struggling down a hill. And he's <laughs> asking to carry it. Um, so, yeah, to say he's a dreamer is probably being nice. Yeah. I would say, um, you know, we might say he was just, you know, just not barely there at times. Um, you know, I mean, he, at once, one time he loses his son, can't find him and thinks he may have drowned and just, you know, forgot about him because he's so focused on getting the bike. So, so yeah, I would say mom definitely is carrying the water for the family. She's the one who comes up with the idea to get the sheets. She's the one who drags him into the pawn shop. But I do have to mention the sheets in the pawn shop, um, which is one of the most beautiful scenes of the movie, I think. Yeah. Um, and really like, kind of gets to the power of cinema and the power of neorealism is that after they give him, give, hand in their sheets, they put it in a bag and the camera follows the man who's, who, who goes up the ladder and is carrying the sheets. And as he's yeah. going up, the camera's moving back and we see layers and layers and layers and layers of sheets. We know it that in that moment that this is the story of many, and the Ritis are just one example. Now, uh, one of the things that also struck me, and one of the reasons I started in with the whole uh, sort of dreamer angle is, so he gets the job, and I think this this idea of being detached, either being in, in a shell shock way or in a way to just not look at the reality that he's facing, is. What I found interesting on this rewatch that I didn't notice the first time or first few times I saw it was, so we see he when he goes for his first day, the guy who's training him for, I guess, the first hour or so, how to put up the stuff, always keeps his bicycle right under where he's working, as if he knows that there are thieves out there. When we see uh, Antonio, the bicycle is probably 20 feet away from him and much more easily stolen because uh, he has to climb down, and then the 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 helper, the older fellow, accident you know, per, not accidentally on purpose gets in his way to let the kid get away. So um, in that scene, I think we see. I, I would say the whole film seems to be uh, a coming to the terms of reality by Antonio after he had sometime in the past before the film begins had turned away from reality. What is let me start with you, Vincent. What is your interpretation of what I just said? Do, do you think that that's that's so? Oh, I think it's absolutely right. Um, you, you know, if, if you think about what happened, you know, before the war and what what happened under fascism. Well, fascism was a very very male centric world in Italy. Um, the women were literally told to uh, have as many children as possible and to stay pregnant, and that was their job. Uh, only the men worked. Brothels were legal under uh, Mussolini because the men needed to blow off steam. You know, they needed to do whatever they had to do, um, according according to uh, Mussolini. So the men were the kings. Um, they could do no wrong. They could do everything. Everybody listened to them. Well, the war came around. Um, fascism's gone. Mussolini's gone. And now the men have to, you know, get up and work for themselves and think for themselves. And our hero, Antonio, if we can call him that, um, is not much of a hero. Um, he's not much of a thinker. Um, he's irresponsible. And uh, basically, his son has to tell him what to do all day. Uh, you know, there's a great scene in the, in the beginning when he brings the bike home and the son notices a scratch on there, um, on the bike. When, you know, the, you know he said, that, why didn't you notice that the scratch wasn't there before you brought it into the yeah. post? Um, and, and, you know. Dad doesn't even recognize that. When they're sitting in the restaurant, you know, dad is trying to figure out how much money they make and he couldn't even write or do the math. So he hands it to the son. 
Um, so there's this real sense of this male generation, the male Italian generation, male Italians before the war, going after the war, really had to change or give way to the next generation because they had blown it. What is your take, Mark, on uh, Antonio's, let's say, the, the, not Pilgrim's Progress, but his progression as a, a person towards reality? Um, I, I think the early stages of the film, it's a little more complex than that. So if you think about the scene where the wife goes up to see the, the, um, the future fortune teller, um, you know, he's, he's quite cautious about leaving the bike there on the street, asks the kids to watch it. Um, you know, he, he often, obviously sort of kind of sees fortune telling as a bit of a scam, they can't afford it. Where, you know, and I guess that sort of kind of plays against that sort of kind of dream of realist um, sort of kind of narrative to a certain extent. Um, but even when he goes up along um, to, to get all his, you know, uniform and uh, to sort of kind of sign on to the job, he doesn't let go of the bike at any stage. He keeps it really, really close. So I, it, it seems like he has some sense that, you know, this is kind of his future um, and th there is the potential for it to be stolen. But then somewhat inexplicably, when I guess the bike is at greatest risk, um, he's very careless with, with looking after that. But, you know, certainly um, realism is basically, he's beaten with it like a bat, you know, because that's, that's sort of kind of the, the, the story. It's how can he continue to go on and keep searching for this bike when it's just, um, you know, conflict and disappointment um, and, you know, a, a lack of progress and support the entire way. So uh, as the film progresses, uh, uh, we've mentioned a few of the things that happen later, but... Uh, just to keep it in a chronological sense. The bicycle is stolen. He runs after the, the boy. As I said, the boy seems to have an older accomplice. You know, it's very almost Dickensian. It's a Dickensian kind of uh, uh, time and place. Uh, and there seems to be absolutely no one in this initial theft that really cares because he's, because Antonio is running after the, the bicycle uh, thief. Uh, right away. And uh, it's curious because we see later when he tries to do it, that's not the case. But uh, um, let me let me start with you, Mark. Uh, so pick pick us up from that point. Uh, he's lost the bicycle. And how does he react? How, how we, we generally see the incompetence or the, the lack of care of the police or even maybe one might say the realism of the police in dealing with these seemingly nonstop petty thefts. Yeah, I mean, he's completely alone. Like, no one's there to assist him. I guess he got some initial help with the driver who tried to help him catch the, the thief initially. But beyond that, he, he is really sort of kind of searching alone. And it, it seems like not only um, is no one wanting to help him, but people seem to be getting in his way to a certain extent there as well. Um, and uh, as Vincent mentioned earlier, like, uh, you know, his, his lack of... Uh, vision and sort of kind of breadth of what he can see like he's forgotten that his son is still at the, the roadside um, what is it a petrol station or a, a car cleaning business or something like that and it's getting sort of kind of very very late and he showed up and, and you know he has nothing like he's been searching all day but it, it's got him nowhere. Vincent? Yeah what um, I always think about this time of the film after the bike is stolen as basically a journey through the institutions of Rome, of Italy, at the, at, you know, for the good part of the film there. He goes to the police, you know, like any good citizen would do. Um, and he's a little bit upset because they can't help him. And this is a, this is a great moment for discussion. And I'm sure, Mark, you've had some of these discussions with, with your um, group. When I show this to my students, you know, they get very mad. They say, well, police didn't do anything for him. And, uh, and I say to them, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. So, uh, you know, we, we're on a fairly big downtown campus. Uh, a lot of people ride their bikes. Bikes are stolen all the time on campus. And, you know, people saw through locks, all kinds of things. Parts are stolen, bikes are stolen. Anybody ever, I ask class, anybody ever had a bike stolen or part of the bike stolen on campus? And half the class raises their their hand and I'm one of them. I've had stuff stolen from my bike. And I said, okay, what did the what do the campus police do for you? Do they, you know, send out, you know, an APB on your bike and all you know 25 cars are running around campus trying to find that bike? No, of course not. Um, so the only reason that you report it is so that if it's found, you'll get it back. So um, the reality is really what are the police gonna do? Really, I mean they really can't help them. 
And oh, you, even though it's in your home, one single policeman, it does take time out and help him. Um, so the institution isn't so much that it's uncaring of the police, but that it's, um, uh, you know, it's overwhelmed. And, you know, there's no, nothing they could really do. Just like the man in the beginning, the bureaucrat is giving out the jobs. He's overwhelmed and there's nothing he can do in this society. Um, the film uh, seems to also uh, portray the cliquishness of uh, the time and place. Uh, right from the beginning, let me turn to you, Mark. Um, we see uh, the poor people that are huddled for the jobs and, and, and the water. We see the richer people at the, the restaurant they go to. We see the people who are live for the bicycle thieves, clearly. I mean, they're not a, a mafia, but they, 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 they help the, the boy when, once he's fingered to give him an alibi. We see the cops. We see the people that are praying uh, go, go, go to the church. We even see the people that, that are watching the sporting event, the, the football or the soccer game. Uh, and uh, uh, do you have any comment, Mark, about the portrayal of all of these different groups that are sort of self-interested in whatever they are. Um, I, I guess I didn't see it in that particular way. Like, you know, going back to the scene where he does uh, manage to, to catch up with the, the thief um, and he's in obviously a fairly dangerous neighborhood. Um, it, it almost looks a little bit like there's some gang members there, some, some of those sort of older guys that sort of kind of come up and, and really um, threaten him almost, but, you know, for accusing this young man. And, you know, the police officer does what he can. He goes into the house, he looks around, but I guess he's a realist. You know, he says, you know, you, you don't have a witness. Um, this young man has 30 or 40 of them who, who can sort of kind of vouch for him. Um, and uh, I, I guess I, it, it speaks to human nature to a certain extent there as well. So, you know, going to the neighbourhood or going to, you know, outside the, the soccer ground there, um, the, the, there's, I, I guess, a mob mentality in a certain sense. You know, like, I guess they, they see a theft um, or they see someone being accused of theft potentially sort of kind of wrongfully and they'll sort of kind of, you know, jump to defend uh, a wrong that they potentially see. So I, I don't see it as society forming cliques and sort of kind of working against, um, you know, uh, the protagonist as much as I see it, um, you know, just, I guess, human nature to a certain extent and, and, and certainly, I guess, uh, more a positive thing necessarily than sort of kind of, you know, a negative thing. You know, these communities are there to look after each other or to do the right thing where they see, um, you know, potentially a wrong being done. Vincent, any comment on that? Y yeah, um, no, I, I agree with all that. Um, maybe the clickishness you were talking about is kind of what Mark was talking about. When you go into a neighborhood, you kind of want to, those people want to take care of their own. Um, but I, I was, um, there, there's a, a geography to the film too that is, lost on us as, as Americans, that Italians at the time would have understood all the different places. Um, the, the beginning of it is basically what, you know, what we call a suburb. It's outside the city center. There are these housing projects that were built, um, you know, during the war or just before the war for, for families, you know, and, and, you know, kind of, it was growing. Um, but these were, this is where the poor people, you know, lived. Yeah. Now, where he's putting up the bike, or I'm sorry, where he's putting up the posters with his bike was the richer part of town. Um, and if you know anything about Rome, you go across the river, and it's you're in a very different area of town. Well, back then, it was very much across the river is is a, a very rich part of town. You can see that by the number of cars driving and also the types of cars driving as he was putting up the poster. And the poster itself was the poster of Gilda, right? It was a David O. Selznick movie that came out right around that time. Well, the posters would go up in the poorer areas. Um, nobody could afford movies. So they would go up in their, in the richer areas. And, you know, they were, they were, because the richer areas, they were still buying the Hollywood fantasies where the people across the river were living out the non-Hollywood fantasy. Um, and, by, and by the way, the the Gilda story probably, as, as you all know, but maybe viewers don't, um, is an inside joke because David O. Selznick, who is the producer of Gilda, wanted to buy the film, buy the script of the film before it was made. He offered to seek a million dollars for the script, wanted to make it a Hollywood film with Cary Grant starring um, as uh, Antonio. And, uh, and DeSica said, no, I don't think so. I'm going to make it. Um, and so um, when he has his bike stolen, 
Antonio is putting up a poster of a David Oselznik film. Mm. Well, Glenn Ford, yeah, he's one of my dad's favorite actors. Uh, but uh, <laughs> and that's a, that's a, that's a, also a terrific film. Um, uh, I did forget to mention one of the clicks, if you want to call them a click, is uh, the sanitation buddies that uh, of Antonio's that actually tried to help him uh, sort of navigate the 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 business and uh, the the market where. I guess you call it the black market uh, for stolen goods. But uh, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, Vincent, uh, there's the scene that's particularly uh, interesting. And it, it reminds me uh, to a smaller extent of uh, the start of uh, uh, Knights of Kiberia, you know, where he thinks his son has drowned and all the people go rushing to the river to try to save it. It's actually, you know, a young man, probably in his late teens, early 20s. Um, but there's there's the moment that you you sort of see uh, en, uh not Enzo uh, Bruno played by Enzo Staiola sort of come over this it, it's almost like Odessa steps and he sits he just sits down almost triumphantly and and the camera's looking up at him almost as if he's like a, a guardian angel for his father who then sees him and is like oh my god um uh, I I did say that I I thought that the son had gotten more favorable reviews than the father in the film. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the performance because I think it's certainly one of, you know, still one of the top five or 10 performances of a child in any film. Um, what is your take, uh, Mark, about uh, uh, the Enzo Stiola's performance as Bruno? Yeah, and just like I said, it, it was just so naturalistic. Um, and I, I think the seeker sort of kind of uh, recalled the moment that he actually first saw Enzo Stiola. Um, he was searching for a very long time for for the non-actor who was going to play this child. And it was almost like Stayola sort of kind of appeared like a vision from this crowd. Um, and, and he knew that was when he actually sort of kind of had that particular actor. So, um, it, you know, his look, it was very endearing. Um, you know, certainly his very uh, believable reactions um, to, to all the different things we talked about, you know, the, the care and attention around the bike, um, you know, the, the concern for, for looking for the stolen bike and racing around, um, the concern for his father when he's being sort of kind of attacked by a mob. Um, I, I think all those things really, um, you know, resonate with, with audiences today as well. Your take on uh, the child actor? Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with everything Mark said. And um, uh, just, to, just to add there, the, the um, Sika didn't treat the boy incredibly kindly let's put it that way during the uh, during the filming of it and at times really wanted him to do something and then since he was non-professional he couldn't do it De Sica would get a little anxious with him because he you know De Sica being a great actor well you know why can't the kid cry when I ask him to cry in a certain scene so he would he would do things on set um, to, to get what he wanted out of the boy so for example if you wanted him to cry once in one scene it wasn't working so they he said all right let's take five um, De Sica had a pack of cigarettes that he had hidden in the boy's coat. And when they took five, De Sica, you know, being the great actor, puts on this performance, you know, he says, has anybody seen my cigarettes? And he looks in his pockets and they're not there. And he's looking all around and everybody's looking for his cigarettes and he's getting angrier and angrier. And he starts going through people's coats and he's getting angrier and angrier. And he goes to the boy's coat, pulls out the cigarettes and start berating the boy in front of everybody. You stole my cigarettes, you little shit. I'm, um, you know, you, you're good for nothing. I pulled you out of nowhere, you know? And the kid is upset and crying. And, you know, then they threw him in front of the camera and, 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 and you know, he's still yelling at him uh, as they're shooting. And that's how he got him to cry. Hmm. That's just one of the stories, <laughs> the, the many stories that come out of the making of it. I'm sure Mark has some good ones too for us. So, uh, well, let me, before we go on, uh, do, do you have uh, any uh, behind the scenes uh, anecdotes like uh, Vincent just gave? Um, the one I, I really, the story I really love is, is, you know, they did, as Vincent said, they did a lot of street shooting um, and they didn't really have any permits to do a lot of this stuff. Um, and there was a particular uh, part of town where a lot of, uh, trams or trolley cars used to sort of kind of run through and they they got a couple of um staff you know whether they were sort of kind of actors or 
or um, you know technical staff to dress up as city officials to actually physically stop the tram for long enough that they could actually sort of kind of shoot the scene that they needed. So let's uh, talk about. Oh, again. Yeah. Sorry, um, Sorry, Darren. Let me add, let me add one thing to that too, because okay. there's a a scene where the boy's running across the street. The father goes ahead. The boy comes and almost gets hit by a yeah. car. Mm. Uh, and that's one of those instances that, that Mark was talking about. That car was not supposed to be there. Um, those guys that were dressed like city people were standing off screen, stopping the traffic there. Um, but a car went around them and flew through into the frame, almost hitting the boy. Um, and Desika loved it because it was so real that he left it in. Well, that reminds <laughs> me of the going back to Chaplin. It, it has a very silent film, almost Keystone Cops kind of, uh, you know, everything. Yeah. Or uh, Harold Lloyd uh, kind of thing, you know, Mia misses. Yeah, I, I know that scene. That was although, doing. although with Chaplin, there was nothing left to chance. Yeah, um, you know, he would do 150 takes of that until he got it right, and they did one, and then they got it <laughs> correct. <Yeah. laughs> so uh, let's talk about the denouement. Uh, uh, it, it is one of the more famous denouements. It's, it's also quite a, a very Chaplin-esque uh, uh, ending. It reminded me. It, uh, the ending of limelight almost uh not limelight um uh, city lights um but uh so the father antonio uh you know is at his wits end and as uh, vincent had said earlier we see that he has a choice between a whole rack of uh, dozens of bicycles one of which probably would not be missed uh and a singular one and you know he I think it's a tribute to, to his own good character, a naive Tay, that he he decides to do the one that he's much more likely to get caught at. Um, and then he does get caught. Uh, you know, at least a dozen or more people, you know, follow the old man whose bike is being stolen uh, and, and they, they grab him. Uh, and so, Mark, if you want to take take it there, what what happens? I guess going back to the, the, the choice of bicycle, I, I, I don't remember seeing it that way. Like, it, it seemed like the bike uh, that he stole was a little more isolated, a little bit further away, and maybe he sort of kind of thought his chances of getting away with that particular bike might have been a bit higher. Um, equally, I'm not necessarily, like, I, I guess in some ways this is a modern perspective. Like, uh, I've had my bike stolen, um, but I always sort of kind of try and chain it up, and I, and I assume that sort of kind of at the bike rack, some of those bikes would have potentially been chained up and everything as well. Um, but yeah, like uh, as we get to that particular scene, um, as as Vincent was saying, you know, like although we don't necessarily uh, you know agree with his decision to steal the bike, we kind of support it and we and we want him to get away. Um, and the way that that scene plays, when he he seems to just about get away and they surround him and he turns around and goes back the other way and they eventually sort of kind of track him down is, is really, really powerful. Um, but as is what follows that, you know, like the, the crowd have surrounded him. Um, you know, uh, young Bruno is sort of kind of at his, at his coattails, they're hanging on, looking very upset. Uh, they, they're marching him off towards the police station, or initially towards the owner of the bicycle, who sort of, I guess, you know, reads the situation and, and basically um, feels that he's suffered enough and, and they let him go. But it's, 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 a, it's a really, really powerful sequence. Yeah, Vincent, your comment on that? Yeah, and the deciding factor there for that man letting him go is, is Bruno, right? Because he, he looks over and sees Bruno crying, and then that's when he says, okay, let him go. You know, he's got he's suffered enough. Um, and what he's talking about is he, he's made a, made a fool of himself, made a criminal of himself in front of the son. That's, that, that's what worse sin, you know, for an Italian man um, than, than actually going to jail. Um, the ending there, though, is just is a great compliment to the beginning as he walks off they walk off and they're kind of swallowed by people and it gets darker and darker as it fades away and we don't know who's who at that point well that's exactly like the beginning all the men waiting for a job or all of the sheets in in the pawn shop and it just shows again that's the story of many italians and i've shown this to so many classes over the years and I usually get the same reaction, but one of the reactions, my favorite, one of my favorites is a few students got outright angry with me after the ending and, and said, why did you show that to us? That was a horrible ending. He should have gotten the bike. He shouldn't, he should have, you know, he, everything should have ended. And, and I said, you know, this might be the wrong class for you. The classic Hollywood cinema class down the hall. 
But um, yeah, th this is showing what life was like. It wasn't a dream factory of, you know, fantasy land. And, and that hits students today, especially hard, even if they don't like the film at all. And most, most don't love it because it's slow for them um, or, you know, whatever they say. Even if they don't like it at all, they respect the ending because it's real. Um, and a lot of people have felt it. So the show that I did right before this show wasn't on film. It was a sh uh, show called Crime and Forgiveness uh, about, about the need of uh, forgiveness in the American uh, justice system. And the thing is, this film is, is one of those things that I think is an exemplar of why uh, just punish, 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 punish is the wrong way to approach crimes. You have to take each uh, crime... Uh, as itself, because we have been subjected to uh, 85 minutes or so uh, of the life of this man and his family and his son and his time and his place before he commits this, you know, uh, criminal act. And I think it's a, a credit to the the character of the old man whose bicycle it is that Antonio does steal to read this. Issue. I don't think it. I don't think it's necessarily all about. Uh, Enzo, uh, Enzo Bruno, I keep calling him Enzo Bruno, the character. Uh, but I mean, I think that plays a part in it. Um, you get the sense that the old man is wiser and he's probably seen a lot of this going on in his block uh, and whatnot, uh, his, his, his apartment building, wherever it is. Uh, and it seems to me that the, it, that is one of the most uh, important things in the film. And the, the idea that he eventually is, to use a fancy term, is, is sort of shriven of his crime uh, by the old man. And then as he's walking off, he, he's sort of been numbed. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't cry. He doesn't protest his innocence when he, when he, he steals it. He just gives himself up. He doesn't fight any of that. They're, they're, they're taking him off. And then it's only when he's walking away and the people who are now surrounding him and his son have no idea what just went on that uh, Bruno says something or looks at him and the, he finally cries, but then he, he put, seems to pull it right back in again uh, as if he knows to be tough. Um, what is your take, uh, uh, Vincent, on, on the whole crime and the forgiveness angle that I just spoke of? Well, um, I think you're right on there and I would use the word grace, uh, forgiveness for sure, but uh, certainly there's grace um, associated with it. Um, you, you know, I, I think there's, there's certainly that's important. And I think you're right when you say that he's seen a lot of that and that society around him, um, is very much depressed. And so he was able to afford some grace. I think there's also a really political aspect to it. I see this film as extremely political and we haven't talked about that. And, yeah, go ahead. You know, that's out. Well, that's an hour, another hour or so. And I know <laughs> we don't, um, we don't have much more time. Uh, the, the short version is basically, I think the film is really about grace and forgiveness. And it's grace and forgiveness for Italy. Um, because there was, Italy was so divided at this point between Christian Democrats, the socialists and communists, you know, politically it was divided. It was divided during the war. There was, there was the pro uh, Mussolini um, and Nazi groups of Italians. And then there was the Italian nationalists who um, wanted to be, you know, fight with the allies and would basically fight against each other. So Italy was completely divided. Um, and then after the war, when the fascists were discredited, um, they had to be reintegrated into society. And I think it's a call for that grace and forgiveness uh, for what happened mm. during the war and pre-war so that Italy could heal and move on. Mm. Well, that's interesting because, but I'm, Obviously, the crimes of the fascists, plural, dwarf that of uh, uh, Antonio. But uh, what is your take, Mark, on the whole forgiveness angle or grace angle? Um, I, I agree with both of those those arguments. Um, but I, I guess going back to what Vincent was saying a bit earlier about um, students being a little bit dissatisfied with the ending of the film, um, I think it's a wonderful and a perfect ending. Um, you know, film is an emotional journey and it's a really incredibly heavy emotional moment and it's a, it's a great place to finish that particular film. And just as we were talking, um, I, was, I was reflecting back on, um, there's, there's, there was a recent uh, photograph 
around the time of um, the collapse of the economy in Greece. There's an elderly man. He's gone to, I think, a teller machine to get money. There's no money left. And he's basically collapsed to the ground and he's, and he's weeping. And he's not weeping because he couldn't get his money. He said he was weeping for Greece and, and what had happened to the country. And, and I think in that, what, that some way encapsulates, I guess, what was going on with Antonio too. Like, you know, like, what else do I need to do? Like, you know, like as much as maybe I started um, this film or this journey sort of kind of being someone disengaged and feeling disempowered, I tried my utmost again and again and again and again, and it got me nowhere. And that's a devastating story to tell. Um, and, you know, finishing with, a, you know, even just a single tear is a great way to, to finish that story. Vincent, you had mentioned that the, the film was not well received initially, but within five years, as I mentioned, or four or five years, uh, Sight and Sound, the British uh, film magazine, had, a, had, I think, risen it to the number one spot on its all-time greatest films. And it's fallen off since. I don't know where it currently stands. Probably still within the top 40 or 50, I'm sure. But uh, uh, talk about the arc of the film's impact and how it, uh, it's waned. And is it still relevant in this Marvel uh, multiverse, or metaverse, whatever they call it, uh, age of film? <laughs> Oh, I absolutely think it's relevant still. Now, so when it first came out in 1948, it wasn't a hit in Italy, but it became uh, well loved all around the world. Um, even, even in America, as the bicycle thief singular, <laughs> where it, uh, going back to our beginning here, um, Americans still adored the film and saw it as these lovable Italians that, you know, are having this hard time. Um, but its impact um, is, is still felt today. I mean, just go back a couple of years, there's a wonderful film called um, A Better Life, um, which is essentially the exact same plot of, of Bicycle Thieves, where, uh, but it's set in Los Angeles um, about an immigrant from Mexico who is illegal, is able to drum up enough money to buy a little business, um, and it's based on this truck. Truck is stolen, he has nothing left, he looks for the truck, um, he's finally caught and sent back to Mexico um, at the end of the movie. And um, so, I mean, it's still being duplicated all over the world in so many areas in so many ways. Um, I said, mentioned before its influence. Um, Satyajit Ray, the great Indian director, was an accountant in 1950 when he went to London and saw the film um, and became a filmmaker and the, probably the greatest Indian filmmaker of all time. The Chinese directors and the what we call the fifth generation Chinese directors, that group, they were the first graduating group from the, the Beijing Film Academy once it reopened after Mao's death. Um, they hadn't seen films since 1945 because Mao banned them. Um, so the first thing they did in the film school was go back to 1945. And obviously the first thing they saw was neorealism. So that first group of films by Zhang Yimou um, that whole uh, Chen Kai Ge, Kai Ge, um, all those movies were very much neorealist films. Uh, Usman Sembeni was a was a Marxist and was inspired by the film. Um, even um, you know at, at uh, Studio Ghibli, um, Isao Takahata, you know the the wonderful film Grave of the Fireflies, which may be the most depressing and hard to watch film in the history of movies you know, was very much inspired by Bicycle Thieves as well. So, I mean, we can go on and on and on and on. We, I can do this all day about its influence. Um, so the film is probably the most influential film in the history of cinema. The criteria for the best film, Sight and Sound, I think is a different category. But if we had to pick most influential films in the history, Citizen Kane and Bicycle Thieves by a mile. Yeah, I do. I, I... When you were talking about that, I, I haven't seen the film you mentioned, Grave of the Fireflies, but I was thinking of The Weeping Meta by Theo Angelopoulos, and I'm like, that's a, that's a, that's a weepy film. But uh, um, I think even as late as 1980, I think it's in Stardust Memories, Woody Allen's character mentions going to see The Bicycle Thief or something when he's away at uh, one of his, retro, his character's retrospective of films. Yes, let, yeah. me let me just turn to you, Mark, then. Um, uh, where do you see this film in the sort of seascape of juvenile what i consider mostly juvenile these the constant uh, action uh, films these constant superhero films this is adult film making not meaning porn pornography adult but this is a film for adults uh does it do you do you is australia a bit more cine literate than uh, the rest of us 
Uh, I'd say no, probably not. Um, I, I, I mean, I haven't been to see any of those films because they don't seem to be worth my time. Like mm -hmm. there, there is no tangible story other than something very simplistic and, you know, being driven by, you know, action and speed and explosions and gunshots and stuff like that doesn't really appeal to me. Um, and it, I guess it's my hope um, in the films that we screen at, at Townsville Classic Films is that we can get people back in touch with story, you know, and, and, and meaningful story um, and having them appreciate, um, you know, I guess Vincent mentioned earlier that, you know, his students feel these films are too slow. Um, and I guess if all you're watching is, you know, the Marvel Universe where the pace is hectic, um, I, I, I briefly um, tortured myself and watched Fast and the Furious 5 or 6 or something on television a little while ago. And I was, I was dumbstruck after 10 minutes, nothing other than the car chase had actually happened. Um, and, yeah, like I said, the, the films that we show, hopefully are, we're, we're putting people back in touch with, you know, story and meaning and emotion and, and um, you know, helping people to appreciate the real power of film. The, the power of film is not, you know, big budgets and explosions and sort of kind of, you know, people with impeccable pecs and, and you know, like uh, unbelievable bodies and things like that. It, it, it really is about the human experience and, and very average people um, doing, I guess, extraordinary things at times. I know I'm in for a rough conversation when I asked a young person about great film acting and all they can talk about is Heath Ledger as the Joker. But uh, um, let me let me ask, uh, just wrap up with both of you. Uh, finally, uh, is there uh, anything else that uh, you'd like to add that we haven't gotten to Mark? And then I'll go to Vincent. Um, I, I guess if there is anyone sort of kind of listening to this who hasn't seen The Bicycle, uh, Bicycle Thieves, um, you know, please watch it, you know, like give it a chance. Um, and, you know, I, I think it will transform your, your view of cinema to a certain extent. And uh, as Vincent was saying, you know, people may well see uh, parallels between the way that this film was made and the story that was told and, and films they may have seen more recently. Um, that's, I guess, one thing that I could share about our audience. You know, we, we do show all the films and they can see where some of these ideas came from. You know, they've seen films more recently that have sort of kind of built on, you know, the rich tapestry of film history and, 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 and films that have gone before it. Um, and, I, and I think that's, um, you know, I, I think it makes cinema going and, and, and film watching that much more rewarding. Well, uh, before I get to Vincent, I will link to Vincent's university page. I'll also link to your Townsville Classic Films uh, .com page. Uh, Vincent, uh, any final thoughts or anything that you think we've missed that you just want to throw in at the end here? The only thing I will, I will add is, and I'm not going to go into the entire political reading of, of the movie, but um, it's a wonderful story and all those things Mark said about it, absolutely. Storytelling at its best and its finest and simplest. Um, but it also has this wonderful subtext. And, and when you have hours to talk about it, it's quite wonderful. When it first came out, it was seen as a very much left wing, you know, back then they called it a communist film. Um, but I don't see it as that at all. I think it um, criticizes all institutions and all types of government structures. You know, the, the scene where you talked about the driver who helps them, that group, they're a group of socialists. Um, if you go, if you remember, they go into that kind of basement meeting room, they're having a socialist meeting, they're putting on a socialist play, and, and, and they're doing it in Italian as we're watching the play, and the director and the actor are arguing about one word, and the word is gente, if you remember that scene. Um, the actor says gente, and the director wants him to say it gente a different way. And so they go back and forth, gente, 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 gente. Um, and this, so they can't kind of arrive on a, on a pronunciation for it. And at this whole time, Antonio is waiting for, for help. Like he, he, he wants to get help, but they're arguing over this word. Well, the word they're arguing over, gente, is people. It's the people. That's how the translation of it. So in other words, they're arguing over the aesthetics but they're, they're forgetting about the people who actually need help. Mm. Uh, so it's a real strong criticism there of socialism, fascism, especially Italian fascism, and the, the, you know, the aesthetically, aesthetic politicians. Oh my gosh, is that relevant today? Um, you know, let the, uh, whoever watches that, whoever watches this decide how relevant that is today in our society. Um, politicians, you know, worried about aesthetics, not worried about the people. So I think there's 
tons of things you could say about it. It's completely relevant today, and I think it will always be relevant. Well, I thank you both for a stimulating conversation. I echo the fact that people should see this film, even though it is in black and white, and it is three quarters or so of a century old. Uh, uh, so thank you both.